Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is fluid properties. Our objective is to define lubricity and discuss important fluid properties, notably density, specific weight, specific gravity, viscosity, viscosity index, and pore point. Additionally, we'll briefly discuss fluid additives. Later lectures, we'll discuss contaminants, filtration, and fluid conditioning. Fluid is an essential component in a fluid power system, every bit as important as an actuator, pump, or valve. Not only does the petroleum-based oil in a hydraulic system and the conditioned compressed air in a pneumatic system transmit power, it also serves to transfer heat, seal clearances, and lubricate the surfaces of parts moving relative to one another, thereby preventing metal-to-metal -metal contact. A range of liquids can be employed for hydraulic systems. However, oil is the liquid of choice because of oil's excellent lubricity, where lubricity is the ability of a liquid to form a durable film between contacting surfaces. Factors influencing a liquid's lubricity are the thickness of the film and the film's ability to adhere to a surface. Consider the range of lubricity demonstrated by three different liquids, mercury, water, and oil. A quantity of mercury poured onto a steel plate would form a thick film or even a ball however, would not adhere to the plate and roll off given the slightest incline. The same quantity of water poured onto a steel plate would adhere slightly better than mercury, however, the film would be thin and easily pierced. In contrast, the same quantity of oil poured onto a steel plate would adhere much better and form a durable thin film. This simple thought experiment shows oil exhibits desirable lubricity properties. Oil's desirable lubricity is important for hydraulic systems because parts like the piston inside the barrel of a cylinder or the spool inside a directional control valve body are machines such that tiny tolerance exists between them. These moving parts are in effect surfing on a thin, slippery film of oil and do not make direct contact with one another. Lacking this film, the piston or spool would grind to a halt, gouging out furrows as they did so, potentially catastrophically damaging the actuator, valve body, or entire system. For this reason alone, petroleum-based oil is the liquid of choice for most hydraulic systems. This being said, other options exist, including but not limited to water, synthetic, and vegetable-based oil hydraulic systems. These special purpose liquids can be employed in scenarios with flammability, contamination, and environmental concerns, however, must take into account seal compatibility of commercially available components and cost. Matter comes in three technically four states, solids, liquids, gases, and plasmas. Liquids are those characterized by a loosely affiliated group of particles that can take the shape of their container and are relatively incompressible. For most of this series, I've been referring to liquid as incompressible, but the truth of the matter is they actually are slightly compressible. The compressibility of a liquid is however negligible for our purposes and is largely to do with the quantity of atmospheric gases that may be dissolved in the liquid at any time. Liquids may be characterized by several properties, notably density, specific weight, specific gravity, viscosity, viscosity index, sometimes abbreviated VI, and pore point. Density, a term I'm certain you're familiar with given your lazy lab partner's study habits, is a measure of mass per unit volume. Recall that mass and weight are two different quantities. An object can exhibit different weights on the Earth, the Moon, and the outer reaches of our solar system. However, the mass, or quantity of material, would be the same in either location. Luckily, we needn't concern ourselves with this distinction since hydraulic systems ordinarily operate on Earth and we're content with characterizing oils using specific weight, where specific weight is the weight of oil per unit volume. In the U.S. customary system, specific weight is often expressed in units of pounds per cubic foot. In the SI system, specific weight is often expressed in units of newtons per cubic meter. A petroleum-based hydraulic oil might have a specific weight of around 56 to 57 pounds per cubic foot, or 8,800 newtons per cubic meter. Water, in contrast, has a specific weight of around 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, meaning a quantity of hydraulic oil would float on water. Water is an excellent reference point for a number of chemical properties and it serves as the standard by which specific gravity is measured. Specific gravity is the ratio of the specific weight of a particular liquid to the specific weight of water. Specific gravity, since it's dividing like units, 
is a dimensionless quantity. Given a hydraulic oil with a specific weight of 57 pounds per cubic foot and water with a specific weight of 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, the specific gravity of this oil is therefore 0.913, meaning this oil is lighter than water and would float on top of it. The specific gravity of water, since it is water, is 1. Liquids lighter than water have a specific gravity less than 1. Liquids heavier than water have a specific gravity of more than 1. For example, the electrolyte in a fully charged lead acid battery might have a specific gravity of 1.3, meaning the acidic electrolyte is heavier than water. While we're on the subject of batteries and specific gravity, note that specific gravity is an excellent means of accurately determining a lead acid battery's state of charge. Specific gravity of a battery's electrolyte is often measured using a tool called a hydrometer. As previously mentioned, a fully charged battery might have a specific gravity of 1.3, whereas a discharged battery might have a specific gravity of only 1.2, meaning it is less acidic and more water-like. Note properties like density, specific weight, and specific gravity are temperature and pressure dependent. Tools like hydrometers must therefore be temperature compensated if they are to deliver accurate results. Moving on, viscosity is a measure of a fluid's thickness or resistance to flow. There are several means of measuring viscosity. However, industrial viscosity measurements are typically expressed in units of SSU or Sable Seconds Universal. Viscosity being characterized by a unit of time, the second, might seem odd to you at first, but it's an excellent description of a fluid's thickness or resistance to flow. Check this out. Given a quantity of water and the same quantity of honey, both at room temperature, one could expect the floor to get wet before it got sticky when both cups are simultaneously upended. Water being a thinner or less viscous liquid has less resistance to flow when the cup is emptied faster. Honey, being a thicker or more viscous liquid, has more resistance to flow when the cup is emptied slower. It makes sense. The key to our successful thought experiment is we use the same quantity, the same container, and both liquids were at the same temperature. This is the key to industrial viscosity measurements using a Sable viscometer. A quantity of the liquid under test, 60 milliliters, is allowed to drain through a standard sized orifice while at a constant temperature. Viscosity measurements are ordinarily performed using two different temperatures, 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 210 degrees Fahrenheit. For a viscosity measurement of hydraulic oil using the 100 degree Fahrenheit standard, 60 milliliters of the oil in your test is poured into a container and heated to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The standard size orifice is opened up and the time it takes to empty the container is the viscosity measurement in units of SSU. A typical hydraulic oil might have a viscosity measurement of around 150 SSU. A thicker or more viscous fluid would take more time to empty the same container and have a larger viscosity measurement. A thinner or less viscous fluid would take less time to empty the same container and have a smaller viscosity measurement. It makes sense. Consider implications of viscosity measurements inside a range of extremes. An extremely thick fluid, one with a high viscosity number, might seal the tolerances between moving components and leak less, however be more resistant to flow, prone to overheating, and a tendency to overburden the pump. A thinner fluid, i.e. one with a lower viscosity number, might flow easier, however leak more and provide less sealing and lubrication between moving parts. Oils with a viscosity of around 150 SSU therefore represent a balance of desirable sealing, lubrication, and mobility characteristics for most applications. By the way, another common unit of viscosity, especially for scientific purposes rather than industrial classification, is the centistoke, sometimes abbreviated CST, where an oil with a viscosity of around 150 SSU also has a viscosity of roughly 31 to 32 centistokes. Be careful of manufacturer data sheets specifying viscosity in units of centistokes rather than units of Sable Seconds Universal. Viscosity index, sometimes abbreviated VI, is a closely related fluid property. It is the measure of the stability of a liquid's viscosity measurement for a range of temperatures. It should come as no surprise that temperature affects viscosity. 
Ordinarily, as one increases temperature, a liquid becomes less resistant to flow and therefore less viscous. Similarly, as one decreases temperature, a liquid becomes more resistant to flow and therefore more viscous. It makes sense. A jar of honey takes longer to empty in the winter than it does in summer given the honey is more viscous at colder temperatures and less viscous at warmer temperatures. Given honey exhibits such a dramatic change in viscosity over a very small temperature range, it would have a very poor viscosity index grade since its viscosity isn't stable. You can think of viscosity index therefore as a grade of viscosity stability. Liquids with a good viscosity stability get a 100. Liquids with a bad viscosity stability get a 0. The viscosity index scale was established way back in the bad old days, so it topped out at the oil with the most stable viscosity for a range of temperatures, that being a type of paraffinic oil. Nowadays, with advanced synthetics and viscosity modifiers, oils can have a higher than 100 viscosity index rating. An extremely stable oil exhibiting little change in viscosity as a function of temperature might have a viscosity index rating of 80 to 100. Believe it or not, some synthetics can have a viscosity index rating of over 400. Viscosity measurements are critical base conditions employed in most fluid power component data sheets. For example, a pump may specify a maximum viscosity allowable, thereby ensuring cold liquid, i.e. liquid at its thickest or most viscous state, can fill the pumping mechanism. Similarly, a directional control valve might specify a range of permitted and recommended viscosities, and a pressure relief valve might illustrate performance curves using oil of a given viscosity. By specifying a particular viscosity, it allows a means of establishing a standard reference condition. Additionally, given maximum and minimum viscosity values permissible, one can establish an operating temperature range for a system based on the range of viscosity experienced at different temperatures for a given oil. Finally, pour point, a measurement related to viscosity, is the temperature at which oil becomes a semi-solid and loses its flow characteristics. Oils with a lower pour point would be suitable for applications in environmentally demanding conditions like cold weather. Note later lectures on contamination, filtration, and fluid conditioning will discuss heat exchangers and other methods used to keep oil inside a given temperature range in environmentally demanding or high-use conditions. Finally, finally, Note very rarely is oil in its natural undoctored state employed in a hydraulic system. Depending upon application, a range of additives can often be included. Additives might include, but are not limited to, lubricity and viscosity modifiers, wear inhibitors, oxidation and rust inhibitors, anti-foam agents, and chemicals to increase fire resistance. Wear inhibitors include oiliness or lubricity agents that can form a film on parts, others that chemically combine with metal parts, and still others that come out of the solution at high pressures and serve to prevent metal-to-metal -metal contact. Additives are meant to mitigate common concerns or environmental considerations, not to compensate for poor system design. Any system making use of hydraulic oil with additives must take into consideration cost and compatibility with existing components and seal compounds. Additionally, not all additives are compatible with all other additives can yield undesirable performance if mixed. All right, that is about that. In conclusion, this short lecture discussed fluid properties, notably lubricity, density, specific weight, specific gravity, viscosity, viscosity index, and pore point. Additionally, we briefly discussed common additives used to ensure long life of components and reliable operation of a system. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.